Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Raleigh, and I am here with representatives of some of the organizations that represent our profession. I'd venture a guess that each of you is a member of or has made a contribution to one of these organizations. So I think we could have a subtitle for this session, which would be Beyond Dues and Donations. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the future of landscape architectures through the eyes of professional organizations. As we come to the end of these two days of considering the future of landscape architecture, it's so appropriate to think about who represents us and how we have a larger voice. In her opening yesterday, Barbara talked about how we need to work smart and figure out be the best ways to scale up our individual actions and our individual voices, given our relatively small numbers. So um, today we're going to hear from some of the organizations that do things for landscape architecture that individuals and private practice and the public sector just can't do by themselves or perhaps won't do. Here's a snapshot of some of the organizations that serve landscape architecture in this part of the world. You'll see that there's four different types of organizations. We have professional societies, we have academic organizations, foundations, and a licensure organization. And their missions are all in support of landscape architecture, but they all have their own little distinctions. So some advance the profession, some support it and invest in it, others evaluate it, and uh, most are advocating for landscape architecture. The organizations within the green circle are the ones that serve landscape architects in the United States. And those that are sitting right on the edge of that circle or outside of it are allied organizations associated with other disciplines or in other parts of the world. You can see the focus of their missions and their interconnections. And you'll see that we have two of our allied associations, um, two that are on our panel today, represented on this diagram. And then you can see all of the other organizations that we operate with and that our capacity organizations represent us in a broader context with. During the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about the individual perspectives for each organization, as well as the potential for developing collective capacity among the organizations to optimize our outcomes and influence and our impact on the future of landscape architecture. Today's panel includes four representatives from professional societies and two from foundations. The first is the International Fe Federation of Landscape Architecture, which represents over 25,000 landscape architects in over 70 countries. Catherine Moore, the president of IFLA, is representing them today. The American Society of Landscape Architects is a member of IFLA and represents over 25, 15,000 members, excuse me. ASLA is represented by the CEO and executive vice president, Nancy Somerville. And the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, I'm just getting behind here, there we go, represents over 2,000 landscape architects. Their delegate to IFLA is Raquel Peñalosa, and Raquel is also the president of the IFLA's Americas region. The Urban Land Institute is a society of 40,000 members. They represent the entire spectrum of the real estate industry and land use disciplines. Patrick Phillips is ULI's global CEO, and he's also a landscape architect. Our panel also includes two of the foundations that support landscape architecture. We're joined by John Peterson, who is the founder of Public Architecture and also the curator of the Loeb Fellowship. Public Architecture is an allied organization that connects nonprofits with architecture and design professions. 
And the Landscape Architecture Foundation supports the preservation and improvement and enhancement of the environment. And they throw a pretty good summit. Mm -hmm. And they're represented by <laughs> Executive Director Barbara Deitch. Three themes that came out during the declarations yesterday are directly related to the capacity organizations. As our group talked and thought about the future of the organizations and how they relate to what we heard in the declarations, we thought it was important to talk about diversity, to talk about global perspectives and responsibilities and exchange, and also to talk about advocacy and activism. We're going to talk about each of these, moving along fairly quickly, I hope, so that we'll be able to trigger your thoughts and your questions and solicit your response to a very specific question. What is needed in landscape architecture organizations as we move forward? We're going to leave this question up and gather up all of your thoughts while we're talking, and we'll um, spend time addressing that at the end of the session. So, diversity, that's a hot button. <laughs> it, it definitely has been on everyone's minds. The shift in the majority-minority population in the US is in such sharp contrast to what we are seeing in our predominantly white male profession. And we also, in the declarations um, and through the panel discussions, have heard about the challenges and the opportunities and the tensions in international practice and the global growth of landscape architecture. I think it'd be good if we started with Nancy and Catherine telling us about what ASLA and IFLA are thinking in terms of diversity. Thank you. I think Gina Ford set it up beautifully and eloquently yesterday when she talked about the need. Um, you all know it. The, we, the projections are that by the year 2043, that the U.S. is going to be a majority minority nation. And on some very key points, um, the landscape architecture profession is not moving the needle. So it's currently not looking like America. And unless we do something to significantly change who's coming into the profession then and broaden it, um, it's really going to not be representing the communities that the profession needs to serve in the future. So with that in mind, um, ASLA working with the President's Council organizations did a lot of data digging to take a look at where we are, uh, where we need to be, and set some goals. Um, so collectively, um, all of the President's Council groups, um, LAF, ASLA, uh, CLARB, CELA, and LAAB, um, all agreed to assign a statement that's, that's uh, titled, very importantly, Mirroring, mirroring the nation, um, setting the goal that by the year 2025, um, we reach parity with where the population was in 2012, which seemed um, a, a still a stretch, but doable. That would require us to get to 12% uh, 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 African American, which is about a tenfold increase, um, and 17% Hispanic, which is slightly more than than 2%, uh, I mean 100% uh, increase, double in other words. Um, but all of us are going to have to work together on it on, uh, and are. Um, each of the groups has outlined some areas that they feel they can, they can start to begin effective as well as some additional um, data and knowledge finding um, to help guide our steps. Um, at ASLA we have for four years done, um, this will be the fourth year that we hold a diversity summit. Um, which Diane referred to earlier. We are using that, that's bringing together um, young professionals who are Hispanic and African American um, to tell us what their barriers were, how they got into the profession and what we can do to help. So they are shaping an advocacy agenda for us to help us move forward. Um, but it's still baby steps. There's an awful lot to do and we're going to have to get um, the army of our members um, out to help um, engage and get to the, the groups we need to. Thank you. Catherine. Um, thanks. I, I have a slightly different um, uh, idea of diversity because in IFLA with 73 nation states, each one has a delegate on the World Council. 
So this is a true embodiment of diversity. Um, it's the broadest of broad churches, and it is a real pleasure to, to be part of the World Council, where we meet people from all corners of the world, um, people, all of them, passionate about the future of landscape architecture. Um, but the question of diversity is, it comes, is more significant when it comes to, it is a really important one, um, but it's actually within the profession. So we share common values, we may share common values, but I think we all need to recognise that the practice of landscape architecture is really very different in Ethiopia than it is in the USA, in Jordan or Bolivia than it is uh, in New Zealand. And so I think we need to be looking to celebrate that and to support and to cultivate a diversity of practice and a diversity of educational programmes. Recognising that the landscape shapes culture and identity, the value, quality of life, as we've been hearing over the last few days. And this, is, this kind of ethos is underpinning the work that many of our delicate, uh, landscape architects are doing to help to develop and shape international legislation, um, pra practitioners who are making policy, giving legal expert opinions, as well as in undertaking economic development and city building. So it's a real shift and a vastly expanded field, field of practice that we need to recognise. And to build capacity, therefore, to grow the discipline and the profession, we need to have a far more expressive and interdisciplinary definition of design and landscape. And this needs to inform a suite of professional and educational documents to meet the challenges of a very rapidly changing uh, practice. Scope for diversity, for specialism and diversity. And actually, really significant to what we've been talking about over the last couple of days, a vision of what landscape ar architecture might yet become rather than a snapshot of what it is now. And then I think we can truly begin to ch meet the challenges um, that we've been hearing about over the last couple of days. That's great. That is a great segue into talking about global perspectives and responsibilities and the ways that the rest of your organizations are operating within a global context and how things have changed for you mm -hmm. and how you see things moving forward. Um, Patrick, do you want to start by telling us a little bit about what ULI has been doing? Sure, happy to. Uh, about 85% of ULI's 40,000 members are based in the United States. So it's, uh, it's not as if we are entirely global quite yet. But there's been a sea change in the organization in the last few years. We've had, we've had international dimensions to our program for a long time, dating back to the 1960s. But um, until recently, it was really just a matter of following our members' business activities uh, as the, the, the practice of landscape architecture, at least in the large firms, became more global. And as uh, real estate investment capital began to flow more globally, uh, we saw a great opportunity to, to provide services to our members and to grow our membership outside of the United States. Um, but more recently, it's been much more a matter of following our mission as opposed to just following our, our members and recognizing that, in particular, this dramatic urbanization that's occurring um, uh, was, uh, uh, cre created a unique opportunity for ULI uh, to, to lead. And, um, we discovered during that process that you couldn't just tinker around the edges of the organization. You couldn't just sort of uh, rely on organic growth of, a, of an American organization or a US-based organization with international aspirations. So that we really needed to, to um, uh, restructure, redesign the organization. So it's been a multi-year effort, but uh, we have now um, changed the governance of the organization in a way that is fundamental to how we operate. Uh, and should unlock uh, significant potential uh, growth uh, outside the United States. So we have, we have ambitious goals for uh, five and ten years with respect to the distribution of our membership. What we've found that, uh, is that the, going into this, uh, I and a lot of our members thought that the greatest challenge toward global growth would have been uh, reconciling the, the cultural distinctions and differences around the world with respect to urban development, real estate practice, planning and design, and so forth. Um, including basic things like language. What, what we found was that those were all pretty manageable and that uh, ULI's approach, which is multidisciplinary and nonpartisan, non-ideological, it's pragmatic, um, it's based on what works, uh, that resonated everywhere. Um, so that was the easy part. The hard part was really building the, the structure of the organization so that each of those 
global regions would be uh, realistically and meaningfully represented in our, in our governance. Uh, and that heavy lifting is largely done now. So we're really excited about the potential of the organization going forward. And it's been gratifying to hear the declarations and their attitude and approach toward uh, the global issues that we face. And we think that ULI as an organization has developed significant capacity there and is well positioned to address those in the future. Um, one event that we held a couple of years ago um, with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation uh, and organized by LAF board member Gail Behrens, uh, where we brought together leading experts from all over the world to deal with the question of rapid urbanization in the global south, uh, revealed to us that ULI was uniquely suited <clears throat> to, to help lead this discussion globally. And um, so we're, we're very enthusiastic, and I think you can all watch. Many of you are familiar with ULI. I know many of you are members, and we look forward to, uh, to uh, working with you to address these issues. So, John, public architecture is operating at a very different kind of scale. What's your strategy in operating in a global context? Yeah, and I should probably, because I'm the, my organization's the least well known, um, and I um, am just a board member these days of public architecture, though I founded it. Um, public architecture, uh, the, the main program that's of interest uh, today is a thing called One Plus. It used to be called The One Percent. Uh, unfortunately, the Occupy <laughs> movement didn't call me up and ask uh, our permission to, to change the meaning of that, that name. So we changed our name to the 1% um, uh, because we're, we're friendly and nice. Um, but it asks every design professional in the country to give a minimum of 1% of their time to pro bono service. Uh, we really started within architecture, but uh, the, the vision always was the designers of the built environment, and certainly landscape architects are, are a very important piece to that. Um, we're in all 50 states. Um, we're at about 15, I think we're over 1,500 firms now uh, doing about uh, $60 million in pro bono services annually. And we match nonprofits. We're essentially an online dating site between nonprofit <laughs> organizations and those that want to give their time to pro bono service. Um, there are, is already a, an active group of landscape architects. Uh, CMG uh, is a member, SWA. Uh, M Marcel Williams, who is just up here, Wilson, who is just up here at the, at the previous panel, or one of the previous panels, is also a member. But th this is something we very much want to see uh, increase, the, the, the number of landscape architects that are participating in pro bono service. And we're seeing, what's important here is that we're seeing it being used to really not only support the social sector, the nonprofit sector, and underserved communities, but we're seeing it being used to support uh, firms and firm culture, R&D, and different opportunities that uh, become available to firms when you take away the burden of, of fees. Um, and we encourage firms to do that responsibly. Now, on the global uh, component of that, we actually only match with domestic nonprofit organizations or those that have 501c3s domestically, but our firms are doing work all over the world. Um, and we will, our future is uh, uh, destined to match with international nonprofits. We just wanted to be mindful before we jumped to an international uh, theater, we wanted to be mindful that we understood how to manage those relationships uh, and connections well. And actually the technology and the, the information is getting much more sophisticated uh, and, and much more accessible to be able to uh, validate what uh, NGOs, uh, what are legitimate NGOs internationally. So that's actually probably in the next couple of years. But like I said, our firms are still doing work um, internationally. It's a, it's a very active uh, part of the, the One Plus program. Yeah. So Raquel, that's a good um, move into thinking about your thoughts on global and local work. Uh, yeah, well, I, I have two hats. Uh, so I'm, I'm the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects IFLA delegate. So I, I, I'm, I'm kind of like the international voice for the CSLA, but I'm also because of the the if America's president, I, I see this continent. So I'm, I'm seeing from Canada all the way to the Patagonia as being our world of diversity and, and you know, how can we, we're global and we are just within this continent and visioning or, 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 or seeing all the possibilities but all the difficulties that we have to reach out. So um, 
I think this notion of global uh, can be, you know, we, we all went down to globalization as being the hope to, to touch each other and to know each other, but we know we have gone uh, maybe the wrong way. So I, I think this whole notion of global is, 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 is a back and forth situation. So there is the, 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 what came out of this whole uh, globalization, I think the good part is, is the, the, the technology that access, give us the ability to connect as never before. But I think the good part, that the, the part that we, na we need to concentrate on, and, 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 and I think if, I, if I'm looking from Canada that we're moving towards the 2017 <laughs> Congress where we're gonna be the, the, the heart of the, of the world, globalized world, and um, we need to uh, address the issue of the importance, I, I have this. Is this coming from the South? Um, <laughs> The locality, the importance, global, I think, takes the real importance of global is because we understand, we understand locality. And I think on that sense, it, it really, the posture is a very different one than the one that we have on globalization. Globalization has this colonialistic, you know, we went in, transform, make consumers, but global in the sense of the locality takes, makes us, um, take the posture of somebody talk about humility, be humble to understand the other. So it's a cultural exchange, a values change, as, as Catherine was bringing it. And, and within IFLA, uh, America, is, is we, we have a great diversity. And the understanding, even within the Latin American country, there is a great diversity. So there is a, a great effort to hear, to listen to the other, and be aware that uh, uh, we need to, to see that we bring something, but we receive something, and then there is a lot of uh, 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 things to learn from the other. It, but we have to position ourselves on that uh, uh, space. Right. Well, let's move on to the, the third topic, which is advocacy and activism. Um, professional societies have obviously long been advocates for policies that um, further the principles of landscape architecture and advance our profession. Yesterday, Martha Schwartz presented a call for, to action that proposed that professional organizations take a more active political role in addressing climate change. The activities and the outcomes of our organizations would obviously be very different if we took that kind of path. At the same time, we're hearing that recent graduates um, are very interested in being individual change agents and um, come to school as activists and are often not um, as interested in organizational kinds of changes. So there, that creates some interesting questions about the future of your organizations. Um, and I'm curious about where you see your organization on the spectrum of advocacy and activism and also, if you see a change in um, your role in the future as the new generation comes into your organizations, or perhaps you try to attract them into your organizations. Nancy, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, absolutely. Uh, advocacy at both the federal and the state level is one of ASLA's very top priorities and has been for quite some time. And in advocacy, uh, whether it's on the activism or the advocacy end of the spectrum, as in most things, if you want to be effective, you absolutely have to focus. And so for ASLA, we do that by applying um, some filters that we believe make us more effective, and that starts with uh, what are the issues on which the landscape architecture profession speaks with expertise. Uh, if we're talking to public policymakers, if we don't have the expertise of the profession behind us, we don't have the credibility, and we need to be able to bring the members out to, to show the work they're doing um, and, and what they have to bring to the table for those public policy discussions. Um, it has to, the issues have to resonate with our members. Um, our lobbyists can do a fantastic job, but if we don't have the voice of our members behind us, when we send out our advocacy alerts, you all are not responding and tweeting or calling or emailing your members of Congress, we are not gonna be effective again. Uh, and we also have to look at timeliness. What is, what is the agenda that's happening? What is the, hate to say it, the political climate? Um, what is actually going to be possible? And that's where you have to take both a pragmatic approach, but also be very strategic and very opportunistic. Um, I mean, right now, honestly, uh, looking at the Hill in Congress, the words climate change are just frankly a poison pill. 
Uh, so we don't talk climate change at that level, we talk about resilience. So when we're talking about the issues like active transportation, um, complete streets, uh, healthy communities, um, green infrastructure, all of those issues, they're tied to the words, the language, um, and, and the issues that are gonna resonate uh, with the public policy makers. And a lot of it is, some of it is pushing the agenda forward, you do whenever you can. Some of it is making sure that you don't lose what you already have. Um, things like the Tiger Grants, you heard how effective those can be in, uh, in uh, Tim Duggan's, what was it, uh, urban acupuncture. Um, love that, we need more green infrastructure ninjas for sure. Um, those, those are pieces that we always have to be there at the table to hold on to. Um, so that's, that's really kind of what shapes that agenda. Um, but two other real quick points. Um, Mark pointed out in the, the last panel that a lot is happening at the local level. There are some fabulous opportunities and synergies there. That is where most of the innovation in the public policy side is happening. And that is a place where it can start at the grassroots and bubble up. Uh, and people of all ages um, and, and interests and time um, can be and need to be involved um, at all of those levels. And the last thing I'll say is because it's clear there's a lot of passion about activism and a lot of opinions. Um, so I'll just tell you that right now you have one more week to answer ASLA's member poll to help us identify what our legislative priorities for are moving forward. So don't lose your chance to be part of that discussion and shape what we are gonna be doing on your behalf. Thank you. Barbara, yeah. what is LAF thinking about this? Well, I think a lot. Uh, I think one of our key strategies is research to achieve our mission, and research leads to policy, right? Research leads, provides influence, and so building content that others can use to help make the case for whether it's more sustainable landscape solutions in general to your um, uh, professional allied partners, or uh, in the case of advocacy, working uh, with the policymakers or other nonprofit organizations who have, you showed that slide with all those other nonprofit organizations that um, uh, do have the capability to lobby on the Hill like ASLA and they need content to help carry the torch for us for our shared interests. So, uh, right, so we don't lobby and that's the role of ASLA, but we want to provide content for ASLA and others who are. I think uh, there's tremendous opportunity, as, as Nancy said, um, the federal level, we have to keep going to the mat. <laughs> you have to keep going there. But uh, also working on the inside through those other public um, uh, practice uh, people to help tee it up and, and set it up and support it. But I think at the local level, as, as Nancy said, is, is where it's happening because they're saying, okay, it's not happening on the Hill. We're going to forget them. We're going to do it our own way. The mayors are getting together. They're having their own climate change initiatives and their own own work, and so I think that, uh, and then when he showed that slide of all the federal legislation that happened in the 70s, that is not gonna happen now. But what is happening now is as much legislation there is happening at the, uh, in the city level and, the, and at the governance uh, state level. And that is where we need people to, landscape architects to pick up the phone and call the mayor. And uh, as Nancy said, um, to be active, and I think our role is to help provide the tools that that can make it easy for you. So I think we have work to do to try to message and uh, create the right um, uh, materials and, and the right support, figure out what that is that makes it easy for you to call the mayor and set that up. They would be delighted to hear from you. They're teed up and ready for green infrastructure and livable cities and all the things that we do. And you know who's at the table? The engineers. And so we have, to, we have to be there. So in terms of the, is this advocacy and activism, you can call it what you want, but um, we need to be active and um, we're here to support you to do that. We need to hear from you on how to do that. And we also provide, should provide the service of helping you know what needs to be done. And um, I know in Carl Steinitz's declaration, he didn't have it in his video, but he was closing with, you know, uh, something about, oh, the question about whether you lead uh, or whether you um, follow or, uh, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You just got to show up and you got to be there. <laughs> so you have to get in the game. And then your talent and your passion and, and what you bring to the table will determine uh, your role. 
So that's, um, I think, to answer the question, we want to support people to be able to do that. And we also need to set up a vehicle to help understand the best way to do that. Yeah. Catherine, do you want to tell us a little bit about IFLA's perspective? Yes. Um, in terms of across the world, there is still a problem in terms of the, what, the identity of landscape architects, what they do, and especially where in comparison with engineers and planners and architects, and there's, there's still a really significant issue. So when I'm invited to go to the different events, regional events or uh, international events, some, uh, first of all, I will say which ministers are going to be there. Um, which, who are the pe people that you really want to influence? And I'm not coming unless you get them there. Where are, where are the engineers and the planners and the architects? Because they need to hear what we're going to say. I often don't say that I'm a landscape architect when I meet these people, because they will assume I'm just planting trees. But, I mean, the fact that I'm president of ITLA might give it away a bit, but uh, it, it's, it's to... So then we also have to have a, a, a really good message. And the, currently the most powerful thing that we're talking about at the moment is landscape as the context for development, not just something that you stick on after all the decisions have been made, and also the proposal for an international landscape convention. And that's being supported across the world with uh, LALI in Latin America, the European Landscape Convention in uh, Europe, the Asia Pacific um, Convention Charter, and the African Convention, which we're hoping to uh, uh, confirm later in this year. And so these are things that people want to hear about because they won't let, they won't support us just because they love landscape architects. There needs to be this really strong message that we can get across. Uh, and so that's what we do. When we reach out, we have memorandums of understanding with uh, UIA, the architects. In fact, the president of the UIA is on our jury for the Sir Geoffrey Jellicoe Award. We have, uh, and we use them to actually, we're turning it round from being something that was quite exclusive in a very old-fashioned sense, because it was set up at the time of UNESCO. Uh, sorry, UNESCO. <laughs> you rub that bit out. Uh, we're turning around so that it can be something that is far more inclusive. So we're welcoming people coming in. And that is a really important part of advocacy for the profession uh, and for the organization. Well, I think I'm going to... Yes, of course. About, uh, sorry. It's your party. You can... <laughs> what? It's your party. Oh, it's <laughs> our party. Um, uh, the, the part of advocacy, it's not just lobbying on the Hill or lobbying to the mayor or lobbying to um, the state legislator. It's also what I call the, the activism of um, kind of the grit, uh, working with the Office of Planning and getting the right codes in, working with your landscaping committee for your HOA to, to get this, you know, all, all the day-to-day -day things that drive you nuts, you know, um, that are affecting larger scale implementation of what we all know and love. So just to um, reframe what activism is and uh, know that it, a small thing can roll up and scale up because of those efforts. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move us to the conversation, the, the questions from the crowd. And I know as we get started, um, Raquel, you had some thoughts about what we need in terms of the future of landscape architecture capacity organizations. Yeah, well, I think I'm going to take on uh, what uh, the innovation um, panel was talking on because organizations are there to serve, and they are they are they they, they need to have a, a that's that um, more organic uh, um, structure so they can they can they can they can serve the need of the you know the, as a professional organization, but also because of all this activism happening out there and and this activism. A lot of times it comes from, from a long time, but a, a lot of time, and what we're seeing right now is coming with the younger generation. The connectivity that they have today are making them much more involved and concerned with working with uh, the population, getting involved on, on, you know, really putting the word out there and being extremely creative. I'm, I'm very involved in a different uh, of these actions in, in Montreal. Uh, 101 days uh, at Table Citoyen, different different activities, and I think these are uh, and these are shaping the cities that we're living on, and I think this is extremely uh, important energy that we need to tackle on, and I understand our organizations are much more structured, but I think we need to find a point of inflection, 
and maybe the role that we can open and, and, and really support this and not seen as they do it, we do something else. And I think elements like you know the, 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 the great ability and capacity that the organizations have for communication, how the, the, the tools that the organization have for communication put it to the service of this and support maybe and and um, and, and also the other element is to say that we cannot do this job alone. Organizations, there is a certain, you know, you, you mentioned we have to be strategically, we have to know where we act, but if we think, and, and a lot of people were talking about design thinking, social innovation, the ecosystem of organization lets us come together and make ecology the greatest advantage of ecology is to pay attention to the, to the connections, to the relationships, and this is what we have to embrace. What are the relationships that we have to develop? Because there is a lot of people doing a lot of things that if we all come together and we develop these connectivities, I think we can go really further away and we're not, we, we really have to, not to think that we are alone and that we're doing it alone. So you did have that slide with a, a, a great bunch of, uh, uh, of organizations, but I think we need to, move forward, and there are others that we're not, you know, they're, they're probably not there, but we need to embrace and open. So I will call for the organizations to move into the future of the declaration. The space for the younger generation, IFLA has developed the Council of Students and Emerging Professionals, and the idea is to give them a voice, to have them right there sitting on our side, and have them come into our organizations, because if we don't open the space, we're just gonna fade, you know, it gets, it gets old, and nobody's coming, <laughs> but we need this, and we're not just waiting for them to come. We have to open the space okay. and have their voices coming and informing us, because this is the way, you know, Good. it's a very natural way to do that, to move Thank forward, you. so I'm, I'm, you. I'm calling on that. Okay. So Patrick, the Look number I keeps win. growing. The people want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about how landscape architecture is represented in the world sure. of sure. real estate development. You know, it's well represented in the global CEO's office, uh, where I sit. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it's interesting to note, if, if anybody noticed the, um, the ULI mission, which is on our little membership map slide, which is to provide responsible leadership in the use of land and the creation and sustenance of thriving communities worldwide, uh, that was written by a landscape architect. It was written by Joe Brown, uh, who fended off the the efforts of many others to water it down and, and uh, did a great job a few years ago. Uh, so Joe was, Joe's always been a great leader of ULI and many other landscape architects have as well. I think the values and ethos of landscape architecture's, uh, architecture as a profession and ULI are very closely aligned actually. And uh, uh, so there's, there's great opportunity. Uh, there's also great opportunity for more landscape architects to join and to become active uh, in ULI. I would encourage all of you to join. Um, uh, so I think from, a, from, a, from an alignment of kind of perspective and values, and you know, it's been great listening to the declarations yesterday and the panel's responses today, uh, and it just reinforced my sense of how closely allied uh, our world and your world uh, worlds are. Um, it's important to recognize that, that ULI has a lot of different dimensions to it. There's the, there's the national ULI, there's the global ULI, and there's local ULI. We operate in the United States in 52 uh, local, what we call district councils. Uh, and it's actually much easier to get engaged and involved in leadership uh, at the local level. So a lot of professional service providers, including landscape architects, tend to follow that pathway. Uh, and, and so that's, the, and, and you know, if you're, if you're working in a particular market, uh, you can, it can have a, a dramatic impact uh, on the community, on, you, on your business. Uh, on how you, uh, how you engage with other professionals. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an organization that is um, welcoming uh, to landscape architects for sure. The, or we've got basically three major categories of membership. There are developers of all types, from institutions to small entrepreneurs. There are <laughs> professional services of all types, and there are um, investors and, and lenders to real estate. So there's, there's sort of the money, there's the developers, and then there's this whole constellation of professional service providers. And we, we try to kind of curate this ecosystem so that it fosters a lively interdisciplinary dialogue um, be between those groups. So there may be opportunities that are foreclosed because we're trying to make, you know, to fulfill another objective, okay. but there's room for you within ULI for sure. Thank you. 
So Barbara, I know that the question that was, it was at the top, now, <laughs> now it's moved down, and I know that we want to be sure and address public awareness. Um, so the question is, we still struggle with public awareness despite 50 years of effort. What should we do differently in the next 5, 20, and 50 years to be successful in the future? Um, well, I think uh, I'm going to borrow from the uh, mid-year meeting for ASLA that I went to, and Nancy hosted a panel with um, AIA, APA, ULI, and uh, ASCE. And I think we need a new narrative. I think uh, everyone's, and it's come up here, I think uh, the AS, the civil engineer said, and this is just an analogy, um, uh, you know, we're losing, there's less and less people who want to become engineers. Their uh, student numbers were down, so they, just, they, their heretofore efforts had been to recruit high school students to be engineers. Well, if you're good in science and math, or you like science and math, you should be an engineer. And now they're saying, uh, they've kind of rebranded it as, well, if you want to build a better world, you should be an engineer. And so, guess what? <laughs> More people want to be engineers. And so I think there's um, uh, communications exercise in, in developing a new narrative for uh, what we do. And part of that ties into understanding the face of, here in this case, America, uh, and what's important to them and what resonates and how, they, how we all perceive the environment and, and the things that we do. Uh, um, I think that that will be helpful to, I don't know the answer, what, what the tag is or what it is, but I think yeah. Nancy. Um, yeah. A couple of things. One is we, um, although we're not making progress as fast um, and as much as we would like, we are definitely making progress mm. uh, in public awareness. It, things are improving and the, the social media and uh, the global reach of the web is something that helps us a lot in that. Um, our tagline, landscape architecture, your environment designed um, is helpful. Our, I hope everybody was part of the This is Landscape Architecture um, campaign. We had 90 countries that participated in that. Um, but it will not surprise you to know that if, um, if you look at the population and who knows what landscape architecture is about, um, the older you are, the better educated, and the wealthier you are, the more likely you are to understand what landscape architecture is. And this feeds back to our diversity problem and the need that we have for recruiting more people, including diverse groups into the profession. So in addition to kind of maintaining what we're doing and, and expanding what we're doing in our public awareness, we need, we need to get much more radically involved in career discovery. And, re and that's a way to reach the kids, their parents, the teachers, um, even the ones who aren't going to come into the profession then will have an understanding and a, and a basis, some recognition of, of having understood what the profession was about, and, and it's a wonderful way to connect with the values that a lot of the young people have um, that are what are so attractive. I don't think we need a new narrative, I just don't think we have our narrative out um, where it needs to be yet. So I think that's where the, um, so the attention has to be. I know go. that Catherine has something that she'd like to add. Well, it's across the world, and Landscape architecture is one of the fastest growing professions, so there's not a problem with identity there. And it's really interesting to see what, these new programs that are being established in Africa, in Indonesia, in, um, in the Philippines, where they're desperate to get the, to the thousand members. You know, they've got a competition to see how many members they can recruit. So it's, it's, it's not even, it's not just the, the position. In the UK as well, there's a problem with identity, but elsewhere, so we need to find out what they're doing to find out how they are actually communicating, what, what's encouraging kids to go to study landscape architecture. In Nanjing, one city, there are 13 universities that teach landscape architecture. Where's the equivalent here? Very good point. So our questions moved on, but there was a question at the very top um, that posed the question of, with um, Trump coming into the political scene. Um, and if we are afraid to talk about climate change on political hill, do we need more uh, bravado in our profession? We don't have time to answer that question. Um, we're coming right up to the end of our time. But, 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 well, wait a second. I, well, what I was going to suggest, what I was going to suggest is I'm not trying to bypass the question. I actually don't think, I think it's a rhetorical question. 
Um, and I think the number of boats that we saw, when it went off the screen, it was coming close to 60. And I honestly have not seen a question today that received that many votes. So I'm taking that as a sign that it's a message to this panel about bravado and about the way we represent ourselves. Um, I'm very glad to open it up to more discussion, but I think that we've, we've heard what ASLA's position is on advocacy. Um, if there's any very quick last words on, you know, thumbs up or down on um, bravado. <laughs> I've got, oh, go ahead. Uh, um, at the Barcelona Biennale last year, there's a, a, one of the uh, speakers said, being a landscape architect is like being a woman in the 50s. You're supposed to look pretty and not say anything. So, I, I, and I think that actually it's about time we change that and it comes back to being the shade loving plant. We need to start talking more. You all there need to start publishing, talking about what you're doing, writing, going, you know, just become much louder about what we do. We, we have to be smart because the, the legislators that you turn off by talking climate change um, could be the ones who are going to be supportive of your green infrastructure initiative, um, of pollinators, of active transportation of a lot of the other pieces that are so important to us. And if you turn them off, they're not going to listen to you on anything. So you have to be smart about who, how you're talking and who you're talking to and be very strategic about it. But you shouldn't be afraid to ask. And you know that you have to look for a long game. Um, advocacy is a long game. It takes focus and it takes persistence. And it takes a lot of hands. So everybody get in there. Um. I, th I think that there is something interesting in that. <laughs> I think it takes a long time. The uh, uh, Canadian Society of Landscape Architects started a, a, a mission to get the, the, the governance uh, medal in landscape architecture for the last five years because the architects do have the medal for the longest time. So we finally um, were able to, to, to obtain this medal. I cannot reveal who uh, is going to receive this medal. But uh, I, think, I think that's, those are important elements that are, you know, connect the, the, the government decisions into what you know, our professions. And so this is, a, I, I understand, is a long term, but, but we need to you know, stay the long. And the other element, uh, for the longest time, the, the Quebec Association wanted to remove from its, you know, one of the, of the communication uh, uh, um, goals was to remove the tag that landscape architects were tree, we, we only planted trees. And, and I, think, I think we should be proud to plant trees, maybe not that only, but I, I think trees are, you know, planting trees, you know, we're having carbon neutral, you know, because you, you go and you plant trees all over the world, but I mean, I think there is a shift on our own perception. Somebody talk about that we maybe we're in a reactive mode, we need to be in a proactive mode and be proud of every single action that we do, no matter the scale that is done. So it's a, I think we, we, we have to shift. I think the leadership doesn't happen as doing it. Leadership comes from the others. We you know the leadership is, is brought on by the, 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 the group out there. So I think, I think we need to shift. There is something on our own posture that needs to shift. So, so last <laughs> quick word really, really on good. bravado. <laughs> it's, a, it's a goal of mine to have more landscape architects as uh, Loeb Fellows. Um, you can be as provocative and outspoken as you want for an entire year at Harvard, so please, please consider Barbara, it. do you have a last word on bravado? Oh, I was just going to make sure John had a thing, uh, to say something. but. Um, Yes, the shade-seeking species drives me nuts, and maybe it's just inherent that we design space and, and work with people, but I think we need to be more assertive with what that means to our life and the planet and, 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 and get out of shade and, and do it. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you all very much.